Time travel has always fascinated me. On many occasions, I've come back to obsessively stare at pictures that seem to show someone out of time. I couldn't tell you how many times I've watched this video of an extra walking in one of Charlie Chaplin's movies, appearing to be talking on a cell phone well over 70 years before this type of phone would exist. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at a couple time travel stories that seem to go deeper, starting with the strange disappearance of a man who claimed to have cracked the code to time travel shortly before vanishing without a trace. Sometime in 1994, Michael Markham was studying for a major in electrical engineering while working at a factory that produced the cardboard tube that goes inside toilet paper rolls. According to his friends and law enforcement close to the case, Mike had a natural aptitude for electronics and fancied himself an inventor, and had invented several small devices such as an electronic cigarette lighter he had made from the parts he gathered from an old broken microwave oven, and an electronic piggy bank Mike designed and programmed to both count the coins he placed inside and display the total amount on a small screen. Along with dozens of other inventions, Mike was in the process of trying to patent, but the contraption he was most enthralled with was simple. Michael had repurposed a laser from a compact disc player, using it to fry the air in between two metal prongs, causing a visible arc of electricity, an effect known as a Jacob's Ladder. Using the repurposed laser, Mike was able to reduce the air resistance between two wires, which created a continuous arc of electricity without the arc ever being severed. And it was at this point that the 21-year-old student claimed to have witnessed something incredible. According to Markham, the electrical arc formed into a vortex that was distorting the light around it, and the effect appeared to be three-dimensional. Entranced by the beautiful, mysterious effect he was observing, he decided to throw a small sheet metal screw into the vortex. When the screw hit the electricity, it apparently distorted for a split second before vanishing completely. Michael stood in front of his device, shocked, and trying to theorize what had just happened. But after a second, the screw reappeared in between the wires and dropped back out of the electrical vortex onto the floor in front of him. His mind raced before he suddenly came to the conclusion that the screw had time traveled. Amazed, he tried it a second time, and then a third time, before he began to race to figure out someone he could borrow a camcorder from to capture this breakthrough on video. But as he did, the compact disc laser caught fire and his contraption was destroyed. Now, this was actually quite the setback, as for some reason he had lost his job at the factory, which was the only thing keeping him afloat while he studied, and he was broke. But Michael believed he was so close to success with his inventions, he just needed to push through his financial struggles and it would all pay off. Although his friends and family noticed he had seemed solely focused and almost obsessive over his work, becoming distant, and seeming to have stopped taking care of himself, Mike's financial situation wasn't about to slow him down. Instead, it would actually inspire him to take his experiment to the next level, one he would have to turn to crime to achieve. He hoped to travel through time just long enough to get some winning lottery numbers in order to solve his money problems and fund his future work. But to do that, he needed to scale up. He began searching for the large transformers he needed, but found out that what he needed would cost at least $20,000. So one night, Michael snuck up on a nearby power station, finding six large transformers weighing 300 pounds each, capable of powering a machine exponentially more powerful than the one he believed transported his screw. Michael somehow stole these transformers and transported them back to his home, and constructed a much larger Jacob's Ladder, one large enough for him to jump into the vortex. But. When Michael threw the switch, the overwhelming amount of energy immediately overloaded the transformers, ruining them, and worse, caused a massive blackout in his small Missouri town. The surge damaged half the city and ruined several hundred home appliances. In an unfortunate twist of fate, just before the event, Markham's neighbor had called the police, accusing Mike of shooting BBs through the glass in their door. The police responded shortly after the blackout, 
but Mike insisted he had nothing to do with it, telling them that his roommate was the only one in the house with a BB gun. Frustrated by the accusation, Mike's roommate immediately told the responding sheriffs that Mike was responsible for the electrical event. The authorities then searched the property and found the several damaged transformers in a nearby shed. With the damage to the town's electrical infrastructure reaching hundreds of thousands of dollars and the theft and destruction of the transformers, you'd probably expect Mike to do some pretty hard time. But this was Markham's first brush with the law and he made some rather strange comments to the judge. He was completely honest, admitting his crimes and informing the judge and arresting officer that he had only done what he did in order to travel through time to obtain lottery numbers so that he could fund his research legally. Because of this, the judge obviously thought Markham to be very mentally ill, giving him a light sentence of 60 days due to him seeming to be suffering from some kind of delusion. During the proceedings, the Kansas City Star ran a story about the event, which helped Mike's strange time travel story reach a broader audience. And while he was doing his time, it reached the fans of The Strange and Paranormal so much so that the host of the hugely popular supernatural radio show Coast to Coast AM, Art Bell, reached out to Markham to get the story firsthand. So, after he was released, Markham went on the show, hoping to at least explain the reality of what he was trying to achieve, and possibly find funding for his time travel research. As he told his story to Art Bell, callers were dubious of his claims, denying that Markham had ever been the cause of the blackout, and claiming the whole thing was a hoax. But all of that changed when an anonymous caller dialed the show and provided substantial evidence that he had been the arresting officer on the scene, then describing Markham's lab setup and the various inventions and contraptions that had been found in his house. This caused a rather dramatic shift in tone in the caller's inquiries, leading to other time travel researchers calling in to share their ideas with Mike. By the end of the show, he had received several thousand dollars in funding to continue his research, and even gave out his home phone number live on air in hopes of finding further funding and advice from anyone who may already be working on the same ideas. Sixteen months later, on July 30th, 1996, Michael Madman Markham returned to the Coast to Coast AM show for an update. The episode is fascinating, and I was able to find it in its entirety here on YouTube, and it will be linked in the description box below. In the second appearance, Michael and host Art Bell summarize at some length length the details of the original show appearance, before moving on to how the project was going, and the madman had made some astonishing progress. Mike had rented a garage outside of town, and had gone from making a still impressive bucket-sized contraption to a 10-foot wide, 7 or 8-foot tall machine. Now having made the switch from a compact disc laser to seven rings, each outfitted with 24 separate 200-pound electromagnets, with the grid on which the electrical arc would travel between now being six foot tall, big enough for a man to step through. See, Mike had met or talked to theoretical physicists, mechanical and electrical engineers, studied quantum mechanics, and met with multiple interested benefactors. And as far as he could tell, what he thinks happened in his original experiment was that the great amount of heat generated by the laser, mixed with the cold 15 degree air on his back porch where he was conducting the experiment, formed some kind of electrical spinning vortex which he described as looking like a circular spinning heat wave, almost plasma-like and that's what he was throwing the screw into. But now he had replaced the laser with this massive combination of electromagnets, which he explained would create a revolving electromagnetic wave that achieved the same effect as the laser but on a bigger scale and much more efficiently. Art Bell also included that this was very reminiscent of how Bob Lazar described the propulsion system of the alleged alien craft he worked on at S4. With the funding Mike received after his first appearance, he had massively upgraded not only the size of his project, but the design and hugely improved the amount of power he could generate, claiming he was now outputting 3 million volts from his six transformers. Interestingly enough, Markham mentioned twice on the second show that he was in touch with a man in Springfield, Oregon, named Daniel Webb. He described Daniel as a coordinator, who was speaking to not only him, but four other engineers and inventors, who were also all close to cracking the time travel code. One of those four was John Searle, a British inventor who was famous for claiming to have invented multiple free energy devices. One of those four was John Searle, a British inventor who was famous for claiming to have invented multiple free energy devices, some using a concept that many claim is impossible due to the third law of thermodynamics, called perpetual motion and another using magnetic waves. Mike even said Webb was setting up a massive lab for Daniel to stage an even larger scale model of his machine. At the time of his second appearance, the only thing keeping him from traveling to Oregon to the bigger lab 
was that he needed to finish winding the last three out of seven rings of electromagnets. The interview lasts for one hour and 45 minutes. Markham is calm, confident, well-spoken, extremely knowledgeable, and doesn't hesitate to answer any one of several questions from callers live on air, ranging from technical questions regarding current or electrical output to philosophical questions regarding the moral implications of time travel, answering all the questions with a quiet enthusiasm in his subtle Missourian accent. This is just my opinion, but in the entirety of my research on this topic, Mike Madman Markham seemed like anything other than crazy. According to him, he was roughly one month away from throwing the switch on his new machine. After this show, as far as we know, Mike Madman Markham never made any public radio or television appearances. We really don't know if he was ever seen or heard from again. A few years later, a listener called into Coast to Coast asking about Madman, spurring on many other callers with sightings and or theories about what may have happened. According to some users, Mike had allegedly abruptly stopped with his research after hitting many troubles and moved to Hawaii to become a vagrant. These claims are apparently backed by posts on a paranormal blog website where he commented these things, which I find dubious. Another bizarre theory was that Mike had indeed traveled through time, all the way back to 1930s California, where a man matching Madman Mike's description was found deceased on a beach, folded several times into an impossible shape, small enough to fit inside a small metal tube, carrying an unknown small plastic device with wires inside, a device that confounded the local authorities at the time since they didn't have anything of the sort back then, but I didn't cover Mike's story because I think he is either a vagrant in Hawaii, nor because I believe that he was found in 1930s California. I covered this story because I think Michael Markham was more likely to have made a major discovery when he switched on his machine, and one of a few other possibilities happened. Either he was stopped and had his work seized by a shadowy government organization, or he went to Oregon and moved forward with Daniel Webb and made an even bigger discovery, and then they were stopped and had their work seized by a shadowy government organization. Mike and Art Bell, the host of the show, referenced the Philadelphia Experiment several times during their conversation. I will be covering the Philadelphia Experiment at length in my next video, but basically, the goal was to use Tesla-inspired technology, including electromagnetic waves and radio frequency waves, to render a ship invisible. But the experiment went horribly wrong, causing sailors to become fused into the hull of the ship, some disappearing completely, and some driven mad by the low frequencies basically scrambling their brains. The government went to great lengths to cover the experiment up, including filling one of the bunkers containing some of the primary equipment with cement. My point is, many people over the years have claimed to have made free energy devices, like Nikola Tesla, only to be smeared, financially ruined, or worse, by the shadowy hidden powers of our world. Not to take anything away from Mike's potential genius, or the genius of many others, but what if concepts like time travel or free energy are easier to achieve than we're led to believe, but only require a certain fascination and a set of breakthroughs, breakthroughs that are not allowed to happen? There's a reason why anyone who works on these projects openly disappears. So, did Mike crack the code? Diving into the time-space continuum? Was he taken by the men in black? Or did he just give up? Michael Madman Markham wasn't the only possible time travel host of Coast to Coast AM Art Bell would have contact with. In July of 1998, during an episode of Coast to Coast specifically about time travel, Art received an extremely interesting fax, far from the kooky hoax-like calls he had been fielding throughout the episode. The fax was written in response to the show looking for travelers from the year 2500 or further, and explained that time travel was invented in 2034, using recent breakthroughs with fusion reactors the research team at CERN, the European Council for Nuclear Research, and home of the world's first and second largest particle colliders, were able to produce the world's first contained singularity engine, the basic design of which would revolve rotating singularities inside a magnetic field, allowing travel through time both forwards and backwards. During the testing that followed, a frightening discovery was made. Travel past the year 2564 was impossible, with that year being like a brick wall in the timeline. With Travelers that went back to 2564, describing the surroundings as a black void, an empty, lifeless hell. The facts ended with the author pleading, please pray that we find the reason why there is no apparent future after 2564. 
A few days later, the mysterious sender returned with a second fax, in which he provided additional personal information and the reason for his current mission. He claimed he was in the year 1998 to help save the world in an effort to avoid the string of events that would lead to this eventual end of everything. Though Art Bell's listeners were starving for more information on this apparent time traveler, they didn't hear from him again, but it appears as though he resurfaced two years later on a message board called the Time Travel Institute, and it was here the traveler would give himself his infamous pseudonym, John Tidor. John once again claimed to be a time traveler from 2036, back to retrieve a very special computer, a 1975 IBM 5100, which apparently had an accidental and, at the time, unnecessary secret function, which the company at the time hid and programmed out of the next model. He continued on to describe his time machine, a stationary mass temporal displacement unit manufactured by General Electric. The unit was powered by two topspin dual positive singularities that produced a standard offset Tipler sinusoid, and he even included pictures. John also explained that the unit used a variable gravity lock system that helped the user to be in the same place on the Earth when they landed. Of course, there were many naysayers and skeptics on the message boards, because obviously, these claims were crazy. But there were a couple details that made his claims read slightly more true, namely the Tipler sinusoid. Frank Tipler, a mathematical physicist, wrote a paper about a possible method of time travel using a long cylinder with the mass of several neutron stars to warp spacetime, and the bit about the IBM 5100 computer was extremely obscure knowledge about the computer's ability to run APL programming language, something only the engineers at IBM in 1975 knew. When questioned further about the upcoming events of the future, John began talking about the unavoidable World War III, but this war would be different. He described it as a Waco-type event every month, getting worse and worse until civil war broke out in America in the year 2004. And finally, in 2015, there would be a very short nuclear war between multiple world superpowers, taking the lives of over 3 billion people. John goes on to describe the more simple and community-based way of life in 2036, after the war. When asked about his greatest fear, he replied with mad cow disease, as it was a great problem in his timeline, which is strange because there was a major mad cow breakout in 2003. Ultimately, John Tidor's goal, and the goal of the organization he was working with, was to prevent further destruction of the environment in an attempt to stop whatever caused the end of everything in 2564. John definitely got many of the details wrong, but in broad strokes, much of what he said was accurate, and some of it to a T. And his knowledge about old, current, and future technology, politics, and physics was unsettling for many. Though time travel fascinates me, the idea of branching timelines, quantum pollution, and an eventual, unavoidable lifeless void in time gives me existential dread. So, what do you think happened to Madman Mike Markham? And do you think it's possible that time travelers, like John Titor, could already be among us? I'd just like to give a huge shout out and thank you to everyone that's been watching the videos and subscribing. It's been a crazy, wild month, and I just wanted to let you all know how much I appreciate you. A new camera is on the way, so I will be back with you very soon. Until next time, I'm Max Powers, this is Parasite TV, and I'll see you in the next one.